completely under observation by the northern uh, artillery and, and troops, is a huge dis distance. If you've got an attack up here, you've got to bring the people all the way around, but you've got to move them way far back to get out of the range of the artillery. So you have, they had to reinforce 15 to 18 miles that the southern troops had to traverse in order to reinforce various portions of the battle line. It was good ground. That's what General Meade said. Thank God General Meade got there on the second day and kept his mouth shut. Because General Meade was not necessarily one of the most aggressive commanders. The person who really ran the Battle of Gettysburg from the north was General Hancock. Very talented, aggressive uh, person. Meade got there, his Meade's the headquarters is right about here. And he looked around and he, according to the written documents, he turned to Hancock, is this good ground? Yes, sir, this is good ground. Good. What are you going to do? I'm doing this. Good. And then he went away. Good. That was one of the best things that happened. So, Lee is still bringing troops in at this point in time. Um, General Pettigrew was very angry that he did not take this area and asked to be relieved of his command. So, Lee detached Pettigrew from Heath, and he eventually will be part of the attack and assault at uh, Pickett's Charge on day three. But the other issue that was going on is no cavalry. Jeb Stewart is way over here, about 20 miles, 30 miles away in Hanover, Pennsylvania, battling General Custer. Custer walked him. The only time Jeb Stewart was ever defeated in a battle is really, you still don't completely understand what happened uh, and all that. That's not part of the story. But Lee was working blind. He didn't know how many troops, he didn't know where, he didn't know their dispositions, he didn't know what was going on, because the major function of cavalry was to be the eyes and the ears of the army. And he wasn't there. So for the first two days, Lee is fighting blind. So he decides at the beginning of the second day, let's attack the two ends, en to take the, the flanks. So he sent a group of troops around this way, and he sent a group of troops under uh, uh, General uh, Sam Hood uh, to attack and cut. At this point in time, Round Top was not uh, uh, garrisoned. The South called them the Little Rocky Hill and the Big Rocky Hill. This is the terms that they used. And they sent the South Carolina units around this way. The idea was to break through the ground in between Little Round Top and Big Round Top and circle around behind the, the uh, northern troops. They knew that uh, Jeb Stewart was over here someplace and Lee was just hoping to God that Stewart would come over and attack this way. And he thought if he could catch him in pincers from the north, from the south, and from the back, that he could have the army. And it was a good strategy. It could well have won. The only trouble is, Jeb Stewart never showed up. They never got up called Till because this was way too hard to be able to do, but more important than that, down here, one of the most creative and uh, talented, eventually, he was only a colonel in Gettysburg, leaders of the, of the Civil War. We'll talk about him in a moment. This area here, the peach field and the wheat field, here is where, and you see the little line bulging out, this is where um, probably the least competent general of the North was. And the best thing that happened that day is he decided he would come off the ridge and attack like Napoleon would have attacked. Fortunately, about four minutes into the attack, somebody shot off his leg and took him off the uh, battlefield. And his uh, other people said, I don't think this is such a good idea. And they moved back up off the ridge. So that was the exciting stuff that happened here around the Peach Road and the Wheat Field. Still a pretty bloody battle going on. But around comes to this side, and we have Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. The 20 or the 10, 20th Maine? I'm blanking now, but he was in charge of the, of the Maine Division, the Maine Regiment. He was a colonel, just recently promoted to that. He eventually became the most decorated Northern soldier in the Civil War. He also is the last battlefield, officially, battlefield casualty of the Civil War. At Petersburg, he was shot, traversed through his abdomen from side to side, causing huge damage. And for the next remainder of his life, he constantly had problems. He went back to Maine after the Civil War, became the governor of Maine four times, the president of Bowdoin College for many, many years. And in 1904, at the age of 83, he died of his wounds received at Petersburg. That's a lot of years later. But he is officially listed as the last Civil War casualty. 
I should talk a moment about casualty. I think we've got some people here who have served in our military. Uh, I don't want to take up too much time, but can you define a casualty for me? Casualty is somebody that died. No, not in the Civil War. Well, not in the Civil War. In the Civil War, a casualty was defined as a person who could not get back to muster at evening. Either because they were killed, wounded, lost, ran away, or whatever. So that kind of gives us some difficulty about figuring out casualties in the Civil War in that period of time. Because somebody could technically get a casualty three days in a row. They'd get back from muster, they got their fault the next day, they'd get back from muster, fought the next day, they'd get back from muster. They would have been listed as a casualty three times. Having still said that, the bloodiest conflict of Americans, and we should remind ourselves that it were Americans fighting, both sides. This was not foreigners. And Lee, Lincoln, in his, in his Gettysburg Address, pays homage to that fact. And it's a transform, one of the reasons why it's a transforming document. Anyway, uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain is in charge. And he's told, you are now the end of the, of the, of the Northern Army. This is, it ends with you. They can't get past you. So what he did is he split his troops. He created a kind of an L-shaped kind of an L-shaped thing. Uh, if this is big round top and this is a little round top, he created an L-shaped group here, like this. But he took part of his troops and he hid them in the on little round top, a big round top, about 50 yards up. I've walked that area a number of times. It's pretty rugged terrain, even you know today, thinking about coming up that. When the troops attacked then, at that point in time, they fought them back several times, and he told his men on that side to just stay put and don't do anything, regardless of what you see happening. Because he knew there was going to be a moment when it was going to be now or never. They literally fought up several advances up Little Round Top, about four or five attempts, till Lawrence's troops were virtually out of ammunition. He got them put together, and as the South Carolina troops came up the draw between Big Round Top, and it looked like they had the moment when they were going to defeat the end of the Northern Army's line. This group of people, I don't know the exact number, stood up and volleyed from the, you know, from the blind side into the South Carolina troops, cutting them to shreds, causing panic. <coughs> uh, uh, Chamberlain at that point in time ordered bayonets fixed, and he said, like a broom, sweep them off the hill. And as the southern troops went this way, all of his troops swept down like a funnel and caught them in an area called the Valley of Death. Robin, Sir, they say the Civil War, 240,000 casualties. 600,000 casualties. Yeah, but I was just... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That wasn't really 600,000 died. No. Not that day. But the mortality rate for being wounded in the Civil War was about 80%. Remember, you're being hit by several ounces of very soft lead. It would go in your, uh, your arm here and it would take your arm off. Just take it off. Yeah. You got hit in the chest and the thing that came out the back was this big. Uh, they didn't have morphine very much. Uh, they didn't have all the kinds of things. So if you were wounded, it, you had an 8 out of 10 chance you were going to be dead by within a couple of days. Of the 20-some thousand wounded who were left in Gettysburg after the battle, about, uh, I'm kind of making these numbers up, but roughly 15,000 northern, 5,000 southern, 80% uh, of them died. 